Hey there, welcome to or welcome back to my channel. I'm messy hair Alicia and today we're going to be talking about the books that I read in April. So let's get right into the video. Hello. So yes, my hair is really chaotic today, but it's chaotic every single day and I'm just tired of trying to get it to stay in place. So we're just going to we're going to roll with it. Before we get into the books, I'm briefly going to go over some stats. Yes, the timestamps will always be linked down below. So with that, April was a weird reading month for me. I only read six books, but you know what? Six books is still a really good amount of books. There's no number of books you need to read in order to have a successful reading month. So I still consider it a successful reading month. I ended up reading 1,630 pages. I don't know if that's average or not because this is the first month that I started looking at pages read. But in general, I would say that I read anywhere between 10 to 15 books every month. Out of the six books that I finished in April, six of them were fiction. Unfortunately, I didn't finish a nonfiction in April. Now in terms of genre breakdown, two of them were literary fiction, two of them were fantasy, one was a thriller and one was contemporary. And out of these six books, three of them were actually translated. Now, in terms of star breakdown, I had a pretty okay reading month. Two of the books that I'm going to talk about were five star reads, highly enjoyed them. One of them was a four star read, one of them was 3.5 stars, one of them was a 2.75, and one of them was a two star read. I realize that I don't give out too many two stars and that's going to change. The reason that I say that is because a lot of times I end up reading middle of the road books that really do deserve three stars but i feel like i give out so many three stars that i need to really start distinguishing between you know middle of the road books that i still either found mildly entertaining or, or even just books that i found a little bit more meaning in than those that like yeah it was a good book objectively but i didn't quite enjoy it I need to start making a distinction between those types of books and that's what a two star is sort of going to signify. It's going to be a book that I thought was relatively good, middle of the road, but maybe it's just not for me. So yes, and maybe I should make a video about what the star ratings mean for me, that way you get an idea. If you want to see something like that, let me know. Um, but let's start off, oh, do we want to start off on a good note or on a bad note? <sighs> Okay, you know, let's start off with my two-star read. That was Brown Girls by Daphne Palasi Andreades. Now, the weird thing about Brown Girls is that it's told in the plural first person, which is the first time that I've read a book like this. And so it really talks about the collective we as a singular person. And it generally talks about the collective experiences of brown girls as a we in New York City and also alluding to the United States. Now see that premise itself sounds really interesting to me and it felt like a book that I was really going to enjoy. But the whole format of it didn't really work and I think there's a couple of reasons why. One thing I do want to say right off the bat is that it is very ambitious, right? To write about the collective experience of someone as a we when there is already so many intersecting identities, even just with brown girls as a group. And I don't think it paid off, at least not for me. I just found the book in general and the topics that it tried to cover to be lacking. The vignettes felt more like an introduction to these problems or these issues, to these thoughts. And I've just read so many other books that really either dig deeper or analyze in a more effective way. So because of that, I ended up not really enjoying my reading experience of it and it ended up feeling very superficial to me. So I still think that you should give it a try if you want to learn more about the collective experience of a brown girl and you either don't identify as someone who is brown, but also maybe if you haven't delved into or sought out narratives that deal with the intersection of identities or of the experiences of brown girls in the US, but specifically in New York. Now, if you're someone who lives in New York, maybe this is an excellent book to pick up because I'm sure there were nuances there that I didn't pick up because I live on the west coast. Now if you're someone who picked this up and also finds it superficial, I would either recommend Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall or Eloquent Rage as they both talk about similar topics that are covered in brown girls but I just feel like they flesh out the topics a little bit better. Now if you didn't want an academic approach towards 
an experience and you wanted something more of a memoir, then I would actually recommend Ordinary Girls by Jaquita Diaz. That book is so, 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 so good. But yeah, I would pick that one up if you're looking for more of a memoir. So the next book that I ended up finishing in the month of April that I gave 2.75 stars to is Nine Lives by Peter Swanson. This is his most recent release. It It was his most recent release and it was another book that I was highly anticipating. So Nine Lives is a little bit of a modern retelling of And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. I haven't read Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None. I actually haven't read anything by Agatha Christie yet. The one difference is that this is not a closed circle mystery. So in Nine Lives, we're following a group of people who receive a letter in the mail and there's a bunch of names on there, including their own. And one by one, these people start to die off. How many people were there? Let me double check. Is it 12 people? Nine. So nine. Duh. Nine. Nine lives. So nine strangers receive this letter in the mail. Wow, I just had to go in and count every single name. I'm... I'm so dumb. Anyways, so they start dying off pretty quickly. So I've been hearing from a lot of people that they really don't like this book. And the primary reason for that is because there's too many characters, too many points of views, and that it's very plot heavy. So all of those things are true. You are following the nine separate perspectives and points of views and it can get a little bit confusing. Now, what I found really helpful is that you have the name of the list at every single chapter. So you can even go ahead and like cross out the people that have died if that helps you, you know, keep better track of the characters. Now, all of these different points of views were not a detriment to my reading experience. And I think that is primarily because I do read adult fantasy books where there are multiple perspectives and politics and world building and stuff. So in general, I am really good about just continuing on with the story and being confused and really trusting the author to get me to the point that I need to be and really just not caring about any other details if I don't need to unless the author keeps bringing them back up. So because of that, I didn't have that same reading experience where I felt overwhelmed by the amount of characters or I felt like there were too many points of views. I didn't feel any of that. The one thing that I did want to emphasize is that if you are a character-driven reader, this might not work for you because it is plot-driven. Even though we have so many characters, they're, you know, dropping like flies. So if that sounds appealing to you, I mean... I wouldn't not not recommend it. So there's a couple of reasons I gave it 2.75 stars. One of them is that it spoils and then there were none. Like I mentioned, and then there were none is a closed circle mystery. This one is not a closed circle mystery, but it just kept referencing and then there were none so much, so heavily. It's like, yes, we get it, Peter Swanson. It's a retelling or it's heavily influenced, but you don't need to make all of those references all the time. It also references a racial slur that was used in And Then There Were None, like the original title of that book, in this book a few times, and I just didn't think that was necessary. But I think the reason that it was so low is just because I feel like Peter Swanson is constantly trying to reinvent the next book that he writes. Tonally, all of the books that I've read by him have each felt differently. And you know, I don't know if he's just trying to push the limits on his writing, or if he's trying to find what works best for him, but they just feel so different from each other. So I went into this expecting something and I got something else completely. So overall, I actually did enjoy most of the plot, but there were just some issues that I had with it that, that didn't quite push it to a three-star book. The next book that I ended up finishing in the month of April is The Rooftop by Fernanda Trias. This is translated by Annie McDermott, and this is a work of contemporary fiction. It is set in Uruguay. I read this for my Latin America reading project. If you don't know what that is, I'll go ahead and link it down below. But basically, I try to read one book from a different Latin American country every single month. This month, it was Uruguay, so I did end up picking The Rooftop. So I initially gave The Rooftop 3.5 out of 5 stars, but the more I think about it, the more it's closer to a 4 star. I would say maybe like a 3.8 or something along those lines. It's just the book that I keep thinking back to over and over again. Now, I will preface this in that it is a pretty dark and unsettling book. If I had to give a superlative to this book, I would say it's 
the most likely to not be okay. If you're someone that finds the world at times overwhelming and you often feel compelled to make wrong decisions or if you like reading about characters who have those traits, then this one might actually work out for you. So in this one, we are following our main character, Clara. And what we know right off the bat is that she's pregnant and that she's keeping her father and his pet bird hostage. And once her baby is born, she also keeps her baby hostage. Now, this is a book that has a lot of ambiguity. We are learning of things as Clara slowly starts to reveal them. We know that she had a stepmother, but she's no longer in the picture and we don't really know what happened to her. There's also references to different things that happened to Clara throughout her life, but they're never really confirmed. Clara is also becoming increasingly paranoid leading to the end of the book. Trigger warnings before going in is that there is a harm of a child. There's also incest. Um, there's a lot of references to deprivation and to scarcity. Um, so yeah, it's a very dark and unsettling book, but one that has really stayed with me and one that I keep thinking back to. The next book on this list is Vida Nostra by Marina and Sergei Diachenko. This was translated by Julia Maytov Hersey, and this was the April book club pick for the Lit in Translation book club. Joanna was able to join me for a lovely live discussion, so if you haven't checked that out, I will go ahead and link it down below. We do have non-spoiler thoughts at the beginning of it, just in case you were wondering. Um, and if you've read it, we do go into spoiler discussions. So I will go ahead and link it. So this is a translated fantasy novel and I did end up giving it four stars. I highly enjoyed this book. And I think this is one that would really benefit from a reread just because there are so many different layers to this book that I don't think I quite grasped everything during my first read. It's also definitely a book that is better discussed with someone just because there's so many any metaphysical and philosophical discussions that happen here. So in Vida Nostra, we are following our main character, Sasha, and she's on a summer vacation with her mom. There's this strange man who keeps following Sasha, and she's really hesitant to run into him. She's also very afraid of him, but inevitably they end up talking and conversing. And the strange man makes Sasha do these very weird tasks that verge on humiliating and embarrassing, but Sasha feels like she doesn't really have a choice so she ends up conducting these tasks now from this she ends up throwing up gold coins that ultimately help her get admitted into these institute of special technologies where she ends up going to school and this is a really weird school where it feels like the teachers there are actually coercing their students into learning and if not there's going to be some grave consequences and i don't really want to give much more than that because it's one that i think you will really appreciate if you just go into it and let it take you on a ride. One thing that I will say is that it does a fantastic job of taking you on a day-to-day -day life of a college student and what it means and just like these mundane tasks but really keeping it within this world and still talking about metaphysical and philosophical things. So that being said, it is a book that moves at a very slow pace but it's absolutely worth it by the end of it. It is also one that feels a little bit detached just because we are talking about more philosophical concepts so if you're someone who's a very character driven reader just keep that in mind and the last thing that i will say is that this is often compared to harry potter but it's nothing like harry potter it's not whimsical it's not magical there are magical elements in here but they do lean towards the darker side so if you're actually someone who reads grim dark fantasy i think this is one that you should check out or if you like russian literature i think this is also one that you should check out so now moving on to my two five-star reads this month. The first one of those is one that I already talked about and that is Fevered Star by Rebecca Ruenhorst. And this is the second book in the Between Earth and Sky series. I ended up loving this book just as much as I loved Black Sun. Well, actually, I don't know if just as much, but it was still a five-star read. So without giving any spoilers, Fevered Star is an expansion of the world of Black Sun. In Black Sun, we really focused on the city of Toba and the politics between the sky I made clans there. In Fevered Star, we get an expansion of the politics and the world. We get to learn about the history and the cultures of the rest of the Meridian, with particular emphasis on the city of Quekola and Hokai Hokaya. 
Hokaiya, yeah, which I found extremely interesting. I love books that focus on politics and history and how it all comes together. You still have some of the wonderful perspectives that you had in Black Sun, but now we're introduced to new characters. So if you're someone that doesn't like to follow new characters or you're particularly invested in one perspective versus the other, this might not necessarily work out for you fully, but if you're someone that wants to focus on the world building and on the history, culture, and the politics, I think this is one that you'll really enjoy. Either way, I'm just stoked for the next book in the series. I can't wait. It was so, 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 so good. The last and final book that I ended up reading in the month of April is called M by Kim Thuy. This was my other five-star read, and it's beautiful and tragic at the same time. There was several points in the book where I had to put it down and I just cried because some of the things that it talks about are difficult to read specifically for me. So M is told as a series of vignettes and we do follow a handful of characters in a non-linear timeline. I think it's also a book that was ambitious in the way that it wanted to tell the story, but in this case it really paid off. The way that it wove these narratives of these handful of people, it just feels like a beautiful tapestry. These characters are weaved in and out of the story. So because of that, I actually recommend reading the physical book if you can. That's how I read it and I'm not sure how it would work in an audiobook format. I feel like I would have been confused if I listened to it in an audiobook just because of the way that the narrative structure works. So through these characters, Kim Thuy is able to weave pieces of this fractured Vietnamese history of the Vietnam American War and she's just able to capture in such a beautiful and profound way all of these feelings of hurt and loss, family, war, identity, and this really focuses on the Vietnamese diaspora after Operation Baby Lift in the Vietnamese American War. This was a book that really hit me because in the past I used to really like to read books about war and about the experience. I remember reading Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried and I realized that a lot of the war narratives that are read are very western centric and American centric and this just gives a completely different view. In one section of the book it actually talks about how in Vietnam they see this war as the American war rightly so. So it was both an illuminating and heartbreaking read for me, one that I highly recommend. If you don't mind a little bit of an experimental narrative style, it's one that I think is worth the read. It's so, 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 so good. So those were the six books that I ended up reading in the month of April. Like I mentioned, I didn't read too many books, but the books that I read, wow, I enjoyed. Well, at least for the most part. Thank you so much for watching. If you've made it this far, leave a tree emoji down below. Thank you, and I will see you on the next one. Bye!